Hello, hello. I hope everyone is having a wonderful winter break and is eating lots of yummy snacks and watching lots of fun movies because that's what I'm doing. <laughs> All right. So we are so close to finishing the Hardy Boys. We're only about 20 pages away from the end and we're going to be starting a new book in January. So if you want to hear the end of the story, here it is. It's, it's a good one. So <laughs> buckle up. Unfortunately, I left the my copy of the book at school, so I'm reading it on my computer screen. But it's the same stuff, so it's gonna be great. All right. Okay, so last we left them, the Hardy Boys were trapped with their dad. They were rescuing their dad. They got trapped. They got caught again, but then they escaped. All three of them escaped. They're hiding in the Pollitt house. And then Snapman and his gang, they were looking for them and they ended up finding them. And so they're kind of making all these threats and all that. Meanwhile, Chet and Biff and all them, they went to go alert the Coast Guard. So they're talking with the Coast Guard right now. And the Coast Guard is getting ready to send a bunch of help to the Hardy Boys and their, and their dad. So that's kind of where, we're, where we left off. Um, yes. Okay, so they're talking with um, the Coast Guard guys. <clears throat> Noting the expression on the three expressions on the three boys, Chief Robinson leaned across his desk and said, I guess you fellows were hoping to be in on this too. How would you like to go on the Henley with Chief Petty Officer Brown and watch the fun? The eyes of the three boys lit up and Phil said, You mean it? Do you want a formal invitation? Chief Robinson said with a laugh. He rang for Chief Petty Officer Brown, and after introducing the boys, he explained what the mission of the Henley was to be. I understand, sir, Brown replied. We'll leave at once. The three boys followed him down to the dock and went aboard. They met the other Coast Guard men, and the fast patrol boat set off. It seemed to the boys as if the 16 miles were covered in an incredibly short time. The lights of the Marco Polo loomed, loomed up in the distance. Remember, the Marco Polo is the, the bad guy's boat. Wait, no. Maybe the good vice guys vote. I can't remember. <laughs> it's been a hot in here. She's moving very slowly, isn't she? Biff asked their skipper. Yes, she's making only about four knots. So it would be knots as a measure of boat time. Not a boat time. Not time. Distance. Oh gosh, I should have probably done some Googling before reading. Anyway. So it would be easy for a small boat to come alongside and take something from Phil suggested. Yes, it would. Quickly, the officer pulled up a telescope and trained it on the large craft. The galley hatches are on the left and the tide is coming in, he reported. Anything thrown overboard will float toward shore. He ordered the wheelsmen to go past the Marco Polo, come down the other side and approach within 300 yards, then turn off the engine and lights. When they reached the designated spot, Petty Officer Brown ordered everyone to onboard the Henley not to talk or move around. The Marco Polo's decks, as well as water, as the water some distance from the craft, was illuminated by light from some of the stateroom portholes. Biff, Phil, and Jerry crowded close to the chief as he trained his powerful binoculars on the galley hatches, so he could give them a running account of anything that might happen. The officer reported little activity aboard the Marco Polo, and the boys assumed that the passengers either were asleep or packing, lug packing their luggage in anticipation of landing the next morning. Suddenly, Petty Officer Brown saw one of the hatches open. A small man with a swarthy complexion and rather longish coal black hair appeared in the circular opening. He looked out, then raised a large pail and dumped its contents into the water. Quickly, he closed the hatch. Holy thing, the three boys thought as Brown reported what he'd seen. They watched excitedly to see what would happen now. Suddenly, Biff grabbed Phil's arm and pointed. Vaguely, they could see a long pole with a scooping neck fastened to the end of it appear from outside the circle of light and fish among the circle of light and fish among the debris. Petty Officer Brown reported that apparently the person holding the pole had found what he wanted, for he scooped something up and the pole vanished from sight. The boys strained their ears for the sound of a small boat. It did not come, and they were puzzled. They also wondered why Petty Officer Brown seemed to be doing nothing about trying to ascertain the person. 
the tenth skipper suddenly handed the binoculars to, binoculars to Phil. Without a word, the puzzled boy looked through them at the spot where Brown had been gazing. To his amazement, he could make out the dim shape of a speedboat with two figures in it. Each held an oar and was rowing the small boat away from the Marco Polo as fast as possible. We've got the smugglers dead to rights, Petty Officer Brown whispered to the boys. Aren't you going to arrest them? Phil asked. Not yet, the officer told him. I'm afraid we can't do it without some shooting. I don't want to scare the passengers on the Marco Polo. We'll wait a few minutes. Suddenly, the engine of the smuggler's speedboat was started. Tersely, Brown began issuing orders to his men. The motors roared into action. The chase was on. That's right, the Marco Polo was the boat that belonged to a different per captain, but one of the people who worked on the Marco Polo is accepting the shipments from the smugglers. Smugglers. Okay, chapter 19, The Chase. In a few minutes, the Henley's brilliant searchlight was turned on. It picked up on the speedboat, which was racing toward the shore at full power, but gradually the Coast Guard boat lessened the distance between them. Chief Petty Officer Brown picked up a megaphone and shouted for the fleeing men to stop. They paid no attention. We'll have to show them that we mean business, the officer told Biff, Phil, and Jerry. We'll shoot across their bow. He ordered the boys out of the line of fire in case the smugglers should attempt to retaliate. They obeyed, and though from their shelter, the three could not see the speedboat, they listened intently to what was going on. The Henley plowed ahead, and presently the boys heard the sh heard a shot whistle through the air. Stop your engine, Brown commanded. A second later, he added, drop those guns. The smugglers evidently did both, for Skipper Brown said to the boys, you fellows can come forward now. The, the three scrambled to his side. Biff was just in time to see one of the two captured men half turn and slyly run his hand into the large pocket of his sports jacket. Biff expected him to pull out a gun and was about to warn Brown when the smuggler withdrew his hand and dropped something into the water. The rare drugs, Biff thought. Instantly, he began peeling off his clothes, and when the others asked him what he was doing this for, he merely said, Got an underwater job to do. <laughs> Biff was over the side in a flash and swimming with strong, long strokes to the speedboat. He went beyond it and around to the far side. In the meantime, Petty Officer Brown had ordered the smugglers to put their hands over their heads. As the Henley came alongside, two of the enlisted Coast Guardsmen jumped across and slipped handcuffs on them. Brown instructed one of the enlisted men to take their prisoners back to the Coast Guard headquarters in the smugglers' boat. You got nothing on us. You ain't got no right to arrest us, one of the captured men cried out. At that moment, Biff Hooper's head appeared over the side of the speedboat, and a moment later he clambered aboard. He called out, You've got plenty on these men. Here's the evidence. He held up a waterproof bag, tightly sealed. It was transparent, and the printing on the contents was easily read. I happen to know that what's in here is a, rare, is a very rare drug, Biff added. I heard our doctor mention it just a few days ago. The announcement, this announcement, took the bravado out of the smugglers. The two men insisted they were only engaged to pilot the speedboat and deliver the drugs, but they would not give the name of the person who had hired them, nor the spot to which they were supposed to go. We know both the answers already, Petty Officer Brown told the smugglers. Then he said to his billsmen, head for the house on the cliff. They may need a little more help over there. Biff was hauled aboard, and as he put his clothes back on, the Henley shot through the water. He whispered to his pals, we'll see some more excitement, maybe. Sometime before this, Chet and Tony had reached the area where the secret tunnel was. The, pat the patrol boat, which had been following them, turned on its great searchlight to pick out the exact spot. Look, Chet cried out. A speedboat with two men in it had just entered the choppy, rocky waters in front of the tunnel. Halt! Skipper Bertram of the Atlas ordered. The man at the wheel obeyed the command and turned off his motor, but instead of surrendering, he shouted to his companion, Dive, Stefan! Quick as a flash, the two smugglers disappeared into the water on the far side of their boat. When they did not reappear, Chet called. I'll bet they're swimming underwater to the tunnel. Aren't we going after them? We sure are, Petty Officer Bertram replied. Tony, can you find the channel which leads to that tunnel? I think so, Tony answered. 
eyeing the smuggler's speedboat, which now unattended had been thrown violently by the waves onto some rocks. Oof. Then we'll come on board your boat, the chief, of the chief petty officer stated. He left two of his own men on aboard the Alice to guard it and to be ready for any other smugglers who might be arriving at the hideout. The rest of the crew, including Bertram himself, climbed aboard the Napoli, and Tony started through the narrow passage between the rocks leading to the tunnel. One of the enlisted men in the prow of the boat operated a portable searchlight. Everyone kept looking for the swimmers as they went through the tunnel, but did not see them. When the Napoli reached the pond, the man swung his light around the circular shoreline. There they are! Chet cried out. The two smugglers, dripping wet, had just opened the secret door into the cliff. They darted through and closed the door behind them. <laughs> Tony pulled his boat to the ledge in front of the door, turned off the engine, and jumped ashore with the others. To their surprise, the door was not locked. I'll go first, Bertram announced. But be careful, Chet begged. There may be a man with a gun on the other side. The officer ordered everyone to stand back as he pulled the door open. He beamed the searchlight inside. No one was in sight. Come on, men, the skipper said excitedly. The group quickly went along the route the Hardys had discovered earlier. When they reached the corridor and saw the three doors, Tony suggested they look inside to see if the Hardys were prisoners. One by one, each room was examined, but found to be empty. The searchers hurried on, to, hurried on down the corridor and up the stairway, which led to the woodshed of the Paula place. They pushed the trap door, but it did not open. Their light revealed no hidden springs or catches. The two smugglers that got away must they got away from us must have sounded an alarm, Bertram said. They probably set something heavy on top of this trap door to delay us. Then we'll heave it off, Chet declared. He and Tony, with the two of with two of the enlisted men, put their shoulders to the trap door and heaved with all their might. At last it raised a little, and then fell back into place. It isn't nailed shut from the other side at any rate, Bertram said. Give it another shove. The four men beneath it tried once more. Now they all could hear something sliding sideways. All together now, Chet said, puffing. One, two, three. The heave that followed did the trick. A heavy object above toppled with a crash, and the trap door opened. As before, Chief Petty Officer Bertram insisted on being the first one out. There was not a sound from the grounds, nor the house, and not a light in evidence. He told the others to come up for caution. This may be an ambush. Watch your step, and if anything starts to pop, you two boys go back down through the trap door. Suddenly, there was a sound of cars turning into the lane leading to the pilot place. The, ve the vehicle's lights were so bright that Bertram said, I believe it's the police. That's good. <laughs> a few moments later, the cars reached the rear of the house and the state troopers piled out. Chief Petty Officer Bertram hurried forward to introduce himself to Captain Ryder of the state police. The two held a whispered conversation. From what the boys overheard, they figured that the troopers planned to raid the house. Just as the men seemed to have reached a decision, everyone was amazed to see a man appear at the rear window of the second floor hall. He had a gun in his right hand, but with his left, he gestured for attention. My name's Snapman, he announced with a theatrical wave of his hand. Before you storm this place, I want to talk to you. I know you've been looking for me and my men for a very long time, but I'm not going to let you take me without some people on your side getting killed first. He paused dramatically. Come to the point, Snapman, Captain Ryder called up to him. He, too, had a gun poised for action should this become necessary. I mean, the smuggler cried out that I got three hostages in this house, Fenton Hardy and his two sons. Chet and Tony jumped. The boys had found their father only to become captives themselves. And now the three were to be used as hostages. What's the rest? Captain Ryder said acidly. This, if you let me and my men go, we'll clear out of here. One will stay behind long enough to tell you where the Hardys are. Snapman now set his jaw. But if you try and take us, try and come in and take us, it'll be curtains for the Hardys. Chet and Tony's hearts sank. What was going to be the result of this nightmarish dilemma? In the meantime, 
Frank, Joe, and their father for the past hour had despaired of escaping before Snapman might carry out his sinister threat. After the smuggler left the attic, they had heard hammering and suspected the smugglers were nailing bars across the door. The Hardys tiptoed to the foot of the stairway, only to find their fears confirmed. If those bars are made of wood, Frank whispered, maybe we can cut through them with our knives without too much noise. We'll try, his father agreed. Joe, take that knife I got from Malloy. As Detective Hardy went, sat as Detective Hardy sat on the steps, leaning weakly against the wall, his two sons got to work. They managed to maneuver the knives through the crack near the knob. Finding the top of the heavy crossbars, the boys began to cut and hack noiselessly. Frank's knife was already dull, and it was not long before Joe's became so. This greatly hampered their process, their progress. <clears throat> Half an hour later, the boys' arms were aching so badly that Frank and Joe wondered how they could continue. But the thought that their lives were at stake drove them on. They would rest for two or three minutes, then continue their efforts. Finally, Joe finished cutting through one bar and started on the second of the three they had found. Ten minutes later, Frank managed to cut through his. Now we can take turns, he told his brother. Working this way with rest periods in between, the boys found the task less arduous. We're almost free, Joe said hopefully. Just then, the Hardys heard cars coming into the driveway. They were sure the police had arrived because of the illumination flooding the place, even to the crack under, under the attic door. It was less than a minute later that the cars had come to a stop outside, and then Snapman's voice bargaining for his own life in exchange for the hostages. Let's break this door down and take our chances, Frank whispered hoarsely. No, his father said. Snapman and his men would certainly shoot us. At this instant, Frank gave a low cry of glee. His knife had just hacked through the last wooden bar. Turning the knob, he opened the door and the three hardies, hardies stole silently from their prison. From the bedroom doorway, they peeked out to where Snapman was still trying to bargain with the police. No one else was around. The boys and their father looked at one another, telegraphing a common thought. They would rush the king of the smugglers and overpower him. And we'll pause there. Just kidding, just kidding. Okay. <laughs> Chapter 20. The Smuggler's Request. As the three Hardys crept forward, hoping to overpower Snap, and before he saw them, they heard a voice outside the house say, You'll never get away with this, Snapman. You may as well give up without any shooting. I'll never give up. The house is surrounded with troopers and Coast Guard men. What do I care? Snapman shouted, waving his arms outside the window. I got three hostages here, and I've got one of the Coast Guard. He's in the house, too? Snapman laughed. Trying to catch me, eh? Well, I'm not going to answer that question. There was silence outside the house. This seemed to worry the man. He cried out. It won't do you any good to talk things over. I'll, I got where you want. I got you where you want. I got you where I want you. And like three stalking panthers, Frank, Joe, and their father pounced on the unwary rank smuggler. Mr. Hardy knocked the man's gun from his hand, flew out the window, and thudded to the ground below. The boys pinned his arms back and buckled in his knees. From below came a whoop of joy. The Hardys have captured Snapman. The voice was Chet Morton's. My men will never let you in here, the victim screamed. He snarled, twisted, and turned in his captor's grip. Mr. Hardy, fearful that Snapman would shout to, shout to order his men upstairs, clamped a hand over the smuggler's mouth. By this time, there was a terrific confusion inside and outside the pollet place. State troopers and the Coast Guard men had burst into both the front and rear doors. Others guarded the sides of the house to prevent any escape from the windows. A few shots were fired, but soon, but soon the smuggling gang came up, gave up without fighting further. The capture of their leader and the sudden attack had unnerved them. The Hardys waited upstairs with their prisoner. In a few moments, Chet and Tony appeared and appeared, and behind them, to the others' utter astonishment of Frank and Joe, were Biff, Phil, and Jerry. 
Stories were quickly exchanged, and Mr. Hardy praised Frank's and Joe's chums for their efforts. All this time, Statman glowered maliciously. In a few moments, Chief Petty Officers Bertram and Brown appeared in the second floor hall with Captain Ryder. Immediately, the state, tro the state trooper fastened handcuffs onto the prisoner. He was about to take him away when Frank spoke up. There's someone else involved in the smuggling who hasn't been captured yet. You mean the man who got away from here in the truck? Officer Ryder asked. We've set up a roadblock for him and expect to capture him any minute. Frank shook his head. Ali Singh, the crewman on the Marco Polo, has a, has a friend who owns a small cargo ship. Right now it's lying somewhere offshore. Snapman was thinking of putting my dad, Joe, and me on it and arranging things so we never got home again. The king of the smugglers, who had been silent for several minutes, now cried out, you're crazy. There's not a word of truth in it. There isn't any boat offshore. The others ignored the man. As soon as he stopped yelling, Joe took up the story. I have a hunch that you'll find your Coast Guard man as a prisoner on that cargo ship. The name of the captain is Foster. You mean our man Ayers is on that ship? Petty Officer Brown asked unbelievingly. We don't know anyone named Ayers. Frank began. He stopped short and looked at his brother. They nodded significantly at each other. Then Frank asked, Does Ayers go under the name of Jones? He might, if he were, cons if he were cornered. You see, he's sort of a counter-spy for the Coast Guard. He pretended to join the smugglers, and we haven't heard from him since Saturday. I found out about him, Snapman bragged. That name Jones didn't fool us. I saw him make a sneak trip to your patrol boat. Frank and Joe decided this was the scene they'd seen through the telescope. They told about their rescue of Jones and a, after a hand grenade had nearly killed him. They also gave an account of how his kidnappers had come to the Kane farmhouse, bound up the farmer and his wife, and taken him. Skipper Brown said he would send a patrol boat out to investigate the waters in the area and try to find Captain Foster's ship. We'll wait here for you, Captain Ryder said. This case seems to be one for both branches of our service. Two kidnappings on land and a theft from the Marco Polo, as well as an undeclared vessel offshore. While he was gone, the Hardys attempted to question Snapman. He refused to admit any guilt in connection with smuggling operations or the shipment of stolen goods from one state to another. Frank decided to talk to him along different lines, hoping that the smuggler would inadvertently confess something that he did not intend to. I heard you inherited this house from your uncle, uncle, Mr. Pollock, Frank began. That's right. What's it to you? Frank was unruffled. I was curious about the tunnel and the stairways and, and the cave, he said pleasantly. Did your uncle build them? Snapman dropped his sullen attitude. No, he didn't. The smug smuggler answered. My uncle found them all by accident. He started digging through his cell cellar wall to enlarge the place and broke right through to that corridor. I see, said Frank. Have you any idea who did build it? Snapman said that his uncle had come to the conclusion that the tunnel and pond had been discovered by pirates long, long ago. They apparently had decided that it would be an ideal hideout and had built the steps all the way to the top of the ground. Of course, the woodshed wasn't there then, Snapman expla exp explained. At least not the one that's here now. The trap door was, though and there was some tumble-down building over it. How about the corridor? Was it the same size when your uncle found it? Yes, the smuggler answered. My uncle figured that living quarters for the pirates, but my uncle figured that was the living quarters for the pirates when they weren't on their ship. Pretty fascinating story, Tony Prito spoke up. Several seconds of silence followed. Stamman's eyes darted from one boy to another. Finally, they fastened on Frank Hardy and he said, Now that I'm going to prison, the eyepieces to your telescope and your motorcycle tools won't do me any good. You'll find them in the drawer in the kitchen. Thanks a lot, said Frank. There was another short silence. Then the smuggler went on, his head down and his eyes almost closed. Almost closed. Mr. Hardy, I envy you. And I... I never thought I'd be making this kind of confession. 
You know almost everything about what I've been doing. I'll tell the whole story later. Since they're going to find that Coast Guard officer Ayers on Foster's ship, there's no use in my holding out any longer. I said I envy you, Mr. Hardy. It's because you brought up two such fine boys and they got swell friends. Me? I wasn't so lucky. My father died when I was little. I was pretty headstrong. My mother couldn't manage me. I began to make the wrong kind of friends, and after that, you know how it is. My uncle, who owned this place, might have helped me, but he was mean and selfish and never gave us any money. The most he would do was invite my mother and me here once in a while for a short visit. I hated him because he made my mother work very hard around the house all the time we were here. It wasn't any vacation for her. One of the times when I was here, my uncle showed me the pirate's hideout, and I never forgot it. After I got in with a gang of hoods, I kept thinking about this place, and what a swell hideout it would be for smugglers. I was afraid to try it while my uncle was alive, but when I heard that he was dead, I thought it was my, I thought that was my chance. You see, I didn't dare go to claim the property as the rightful heir, but now I'm planning to take it over. Of course, it won't do any good, because I know I'll have to do a long stretch in the pen. But I'm going, to ask, I'm going to ask the executors to use my uncle's money to run this place as a boy's home. I mean, a place where boys without proper home training can come to live. The group listening to, Sna to Snapman, King of the Smugglers, were too overwhelmed by his complete change of heart to say anything for a few seconds. But when the man looked up, as if pleading for his hearers to believe him, Mr. Hardy said, it's a very fine thing for you to do, Snapman. I'm sure the boys who, who benefit from living here will always be grateful to you. The solemn scene was suddenly interrupted by the return of Chief Petty Officer Brown. He reported that another patrol boat had picked up his message about Captain Foster's ship, and within a few minutes had reported sighting it. Then, within a quarter of an hour, word came that Captain Foster had been put under arrest and that the missing, missing Coast Guard man had been found on the ship, as well as a quantity of merchandise which the captain had expected Snapman to remove. The prisoners were now taken away from the Paul at home, and the Hardys and their friends found themselves alone. Chet asked suddenly, How do we get home? Tony grinned. I guess the Napoli will hold all of us. The group went to the woodshed, opened the trap door, and started down the secret passageway to the pond below. They climbed into the Napoli, and T Tony slipped behind the wheel. The Coast Guard men thoughtfully had left the portable searchlight on the prow, and Tony was able to make the trip through the tunnel and the narrow channel out to the ocean without accident. Suddenly, Frank spoke up. Dad, wh what happened to your car? Mr. Hardy smiled. It's in, the, it's in Bayport in a garage. I was being followed, so I shook off the shadowers and took the bus. He added ruefully. But had it didn't do me much good, Statman's men tack attacked me and took me prisoner on the road. The famous detective now said, While I have the chance, I want to thank each of you boys individually for what you did. Without the seven of you, this case might never have been solved, and I might not have been found alive. Modestly, Frank and Joe and their friends acknowledged the praise, secretly hoping another mystery would come their way soon. I bet one will. One did, and by learning the secret of the old mill, the Hardy Boys encountered a cunning gang of counterfeiters. Suddenly, Joe remarked, Compliments are fly flying around here pretty thick, but there's one person we forgot to mention. Without him, Frank and I might never have even found Dad. Who's that? Griff asked. Pretzel Pete, Joe replied. That's right, said Frank. All together, fellas. A rousing cheer for Pretzel Pete. <laughs> the end. <laughs> All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this one. I love the Hardy Boys series. And one of the best things about it, you don't even have to read them in order. You can read them in any, any order you'd like. All of the mysteries are independent. <laughs> this is a mystery story. So when you put this into your 40 book tracker, it'll go into that mystery section. There are, oh, let me look it up. Um, how many pages? Got 
There are 193 pages in the Hardy Boys book two. And so when you put that, put that in there, make sure you put the page number in there so we know how many it counts for. I'll be putting this into mine as well. So if you'd like to go on to my tab of the 40 book tracker and just highlight those, control C, copy that, and then control V, paste it into yours. That works too. And uh, yeah, I, if, if you listen to all this, congratulations. Thank you very much. And we could do, we could do something kind of fun if you want. If you listen to all this, comment on Google Classroom with your favorite um with your favorite dessert comment your favorite dessert if you've made it to this far in the video anyway hope you have a wonderful winter break and i will see you in january goodbye <laughs>